Doing fine, doing fine. I know we're getting a late head start because you wanted to watch that uh, Lucas <laughs> and uh, Abel Ramos. So. Oh boy, I should have. I should have started it earlier. I could have. I could have penned this one. It was a glorified sparring session, sir. But I tell you, what, before mm. we get started, I do have to announce that this show is brought to you by Fightsonga.com and Box Buzz. Guys, for all the latest boxing news, please go to the Box.Buzz hub for all the latest boxing news. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee Cleveland. God bless you, brother. But I I tell you what, man, a very lackluster weekend of boxing. Now, some fights on the undercards on both of them were quite entertaining with, you know, very outstanding performances from a lot of young fighters. Uh, But Gogi, the headliners really failed to sizzle, and this is bad for boxing. Not only in the fight card that we just saw, right? Not only was it a less than scintillating. (laughs) I mean, when, when someone who's fighting for a version of the WBA welterweight title, right, the vacant title, when he throws less than eight, punches or lands less than eight punches around. That's not good, Gogi. And this was for a version of the WBA welterweight title. So, (laughs) Jordanius Ugas comes away with the split decision victory over Abel Ramos. Wow, with scores of 115-113 twice and 117-111 for Abel Ramos. That was Dr. Lou Moret. Is it time, Gogi, that we put this gentleman out to pasture? Mm. You're talking about Lou Moret, huh? Dr. Lou Moret, yep. Oh, jeez. That guy's still roughing, Joe. I, I remember him from the 80s when he was uh, still roughing, back, way back then. God, he's still, uh-huh. he still got a gig as a ref, huh? Oh. Unbelievable. Well, yeah, and in California, the the California State Athletic Commission, you you're required to do both. Not only required to be a ref, but you're required to be a judge as well, if you actually mm. want to work for the State Athletic Commission in California. And to mm. be honest with you, he has just become ineffective at both. Uh, but Gogi, to me, and to Lennox Lewis. Joe Goose and very two very intelligent boxing minds. They had it a complete shutout for Yordanius Ugas. How were the judges so far off? Because even the guys who who scored the bout in favor of, of the new vacant WBC or WBA welterweight champion, even they were off. Seven rounds to five, and we all saw it as a complete shutout. How did they get it so wrong, Gogi? Do you have any theories on on how this could possibly happen? Because this is gross incompetence. That's about it, Joe. You said it all. You said it like that. Every, like I said, everybody, what do you call it, has a different, you know, perspective on how they judge fights and everything. And uh, uh, what's what's that lady's name, Miss uh, Miss Bird, Adelaide Bird? Adelaide yeah, she, Bird. Oh boy, yeah, she prefers yeah. the boxers over the the aggressive yeah, punchers. That? What's that goof? What's that other female judge? She retired after getting all that. CJ Ross remember? was suspended indefinitely. Yep. What's her name? CJ Ross. Yeah. CJ uh, Ross. Yeah. I heard yep. she retired. I heard she retired after that fight because she couldn't take uh, you know all the flights and everything. Wow, there's a lot of them, Joe. It's just you know I don't know <laughs> how they judge them. Uh, I don't know how they I mean judge them. I don't know how they train these guys. Uh, uh, or they or do they have on? Uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know. Like in service training, where they you know where they get classes every month to make sure they're doing their job or updates or whatever or practice well, scoring practice scoring fights and stuff like that. Yeah, you know I mean. Well, all I can say is this: I only know how the Texas State Athletic Commission actually handles their business, and they start you out at the amateur level, and then they work you up at the club level, then the mid level, and bef- and then you have to be critiqued. By guys like Greg Alvarez, right? Um, mm-hmm. Guys like uh, um, Cole, and before you can mm-hmm. advance to doing TV fights or title fights or major prospect fights, because the last thing a promoter wants is to have a negligent judge 
really put an X on the career of a promising and blossoming prospect, right? Yeah. What I want to know is, Gogi, how come no one has – I don't think any commission has yet to suggest this, and this seems like a no-brainer to me. Why don't we get trainers and former fighters, retired fighters, to start scoring these prize fights? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I know one former fighter, uh, amateur fighter, uh, he's a ref, uh, Javier – Alvarez, uh, Greg Alvarez, the head of the Texas State Athletic Commission, his brother, he's pretty good. Uh, you know, you know, Joe, it's, it's all about, you know, uh, ongoing training, uh, you know, keeping, you know, keeping these guys sharp, just like fighters, one thing, and they got to fight a lot to stay sharp, or the refs, you know what I mean, uh, they basically, you got to, uh, you know, be trained all the time, you know, not just show up to the night of the fight and expect them to do it right. I don't, like I said, that's, uh, what do you call it? That's not in my, uh, what do you call it? Uh, spe- that's not my specialization. So, you know, I don't, you know, I just go there, you know, take the guy to fight and hopefully knock the motherfucker out so when we have to worry about the judges, okay? So. <laughs> you know. Well. <laughs> especially, in, especially in South Texas. Oh, they got some shit judges, man. Oh, I'm not, I'm not going to name them, but they got some fucking clown judges, okay? And uh, I got shafted a few times in fights over there, man. Like I knew we won, and it's just, uh, you know, they're, you know, they don't understand. You know, they they score the uh, fights like amateur fights. You know, the guy that throws uh, the most punches, the guy that comes forward and uh, that's aggressive and everything. You know, they don't score. You know, they don't use a you know four criteria for uh, judging fights. You know, ring generalship, defense, clean, effective punches. Uh, you know, stuff like that, Joe. Uh, you know, they just. They, they they look at who's throwing more punches and who's aggressive. Who's aggressive? No and they'll, you know, they'll give the guy the round. Yeah, clowns, man. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, guys, so we're going to go over the scoring criteria very quickly. Uh, first and foremost, your first, this is usually what dig in. Harold Letterman, I remember asking him, well, how do you score a prize fight, Harold? And he tells me, oh, well, you know, it's pretty simple. You know, you look at both guys, and you look who's doing the most damage, and that's who carries the round. That's what he told me. Well, in theory, yeah, sure. But if you're you're actually scoring a price fight like this, once again, the primary scoring criteria, guys, and this is primary, it's the clean, effective, and consequential punches landed. And if you can't determine who carries the round from that primary scoring criteria, then you move down to the secondary scoring criteria, which is ring generalship or effective aggression. Yeah. And that's it. It's that simple. Who's dictating the pace? Who's controlling range? Who's dictating the action of the fight? Who's dictating the pace of the fight? Who's got that's control ring generalship yeah. or effective aggression. So it yeah. should be very simple in theory. But for some strange reason, people like to put their own touches on it. Like Adelaide yeah. Bird, you just mentioned her. Like, I, I chose this, and, and I'm like, okay, well, there's a reason why Golden Boy Promotion, they're choosing Adelaide Bird, right? Because they give a list of judges. And the, the lead promoter says, okay, well, we want this guy. The other party has to sign off on it. Nevada State Athletic Commission signs off on it, and there you have it. There's a reason for Canelo versus Triple G, one, right? There's a reason why Mm -hmm. Golden Boy Promotions chose Adelaide Bird, because she always favors the boxer. That's her preference. If there's an aggressive fighter and a boxer puncher, like Joe Calzaghe versus Bernard Hopkins, she is always going to favor the defensive-minded boxer puncher. She prefers that style. Right? So you mm-hmm. knew that was one in the bag for Canelo Alvarez. You knew that going into it. Right? You have to mm-hmm. do above and beyond to get her to give you the round. You basically have to beat the boxer from pillar to post to get her to give you the round. And C.J. Ross, I noticed that she had a preference going into the fight that for some reason she favors like, she will always give the benefit to the B-side. She, she prided herself, right, on being that maverick at ringside. 
that she wasn't going to be influenced by the promoter and she was going to give the benefit of all the close rounds to the B-side. So when Canelo fought Mayweather, she gave all of the competitive rounds the benefit of the close rounds to Canelo Alvarez instead of Floyd Mayweather and scored that fight a draw. Mm. So you're absolutely right, Gogi, when you say that every judge has their own personal taste and preference in who's doing, quote-unquote, the more effective and consequential uh, work. Your final thoughts on this before we, well, talk about more boxing news, sir. And nothing, you know, Joe. Boxing, what do you call it, controversial scoring has been around since I remember, since the 70s and everything. Uh Nah, I don't want to. I don't want to mention this. Yeah, I go. What the fuck? Go ahead. What happened was, uh, I remember Don Chargin. <laughs> I remember Don Chargin. Uh, he had uh, Palomino, uh, Carlos, the WBC champion. He went to Puerto Rico yeah, and fought the Carlos Nugas. Palomino. Yeah, he fought. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, well, yeah, he. You know, Benitez won. Benitez won the title. I can't remember. Uh, that, I can't remember who the judge was. Z Clayton or. Or Zach Clayton or something like that, and Don was telling me that you know he gave, I think he gave the fight to uh, Palomino, and he was all, you know, Aaron was all mad after the fight, you know, and started bad mouthing him in the media and everything. I can't, man, I can't remember the names like I used to. Kali, I well, can't that, remember. That's all right, Gogi. Fight. What fight was it? It was uh, Palomino versus. Yeah, that was Don Boom. Fighter Palomino and uh, Wilfredo Benitez when Benitez won uh, the welterweight title. Well, Aaron wasn't happy. Uh, with the with the scoring, because uh, uh, I think uh, that one judge gave it to uh, Palomino, and he started bad mouthing them in the news, in the press, and this and that. So the guy sued him. <laughs> wow, so, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you were funny. right, Gogi. Judge Zach Clayton had the about one forty five, one forty two for Palomino. Now keep in mind, these yeah, were that's the one. Fifteen round yeah. fights, right? Yeah, and yeah. After the fight, yeah, Aaron was bad mouthing him to the media and everything, and saying he was a crook and this and that. So the guy sued Aaron, and yeah, <laughs> I leave it like that. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, and this that, is yeah. and and this is one thing I can't stand about fans, fighters, promoters, yeah. um, even trainers, right? They, yeah. Guys who should know better, right? They always like Teddy Atlas is the worst. He's the biggest culprit of this. You know, in, rather than actually trying to give a sane explanation, rational explanation as to why these are so wide and differ from fight to fight, right, or from judge to judge, he always cries corruption. Fans will always say, oh, too yeah. much corruption in this sport of boxing. But in the reality, Gogi, every sport suffers from this human element. How many times have you been watching the NFL and they blow a call? Yeah, but there is corruption And you lose the game, no. and, the, and the commissioner. No. Yeah, go, go ahead, Go fight sir. in Mexico. Go fight in Mexico, okay? Uh, okay yeah. <laughs> I'll give you an example. I had my guy Tony Lopez, the Tiger, you know, three-time world champion. We fought Julio Cesar Chavez in Monterey. You know, I swear to God, you know, it, 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 they stopped the fight. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the whole story, but everything was rigged from the scale, from the way in, all the way from – and they picked, you know, you know, Jose Suleiman, you know, picked all the judges to make sure, uh, you know, Julio was taken care of because, you know, that was her hero back then. And uh-huh. I would have sworn we we won at least, uh, you know, the fight was stopped in the ninth or tenth because of cuts or something like that. And I would have sworn uh, we won at least three, four rounds. You know, I looked at the scorecard after because I thought it was, you know, I thought Julio was up maybe a couple points. We lost every damn round from every judge. I'm like, holy wow. shit! But I knew we were, I knew we were screwed, Joe, at the weigh-in. I mean, I'll tell you about it one day. I knew we were in to get, you know, to get the screwing. You know, they, you know, they were doing everything to make sure, you know, he he would win. And yeah, we we lost every, you know. I looked at the scorecards. We didn't win one round of none of them judges. I'm like, oh god. Yeah, so you know what I mean, Joe. Yeah, uh, there is corruption, and because you know what, look, you got if you get assigned, uh, you know, to be a judge in a world title fight, you know, you got to take care of the uh, the WBC uh, favorite fighter. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? You got to, you know, you know what I mean? Or if you want more gigs as a judge, you know what I mean? Uh. You understand, Joe? If you want more work, I do. I sure do. You gotta be. You gotta be. You gotta be political. Okay. 
Well, when you look, I think, I think honestly, and a lot of people feel that way, Gogi. I've heard that from so many fighters and so many trainers. But think about in the case of Edwin Rodriguez versus Will Rosinski almost a decade ago, right? It was a 10-round fight on Showbox, the next generation. Great fight. Every round was competitive, but all three judges at the end of the fight, at the end of the, at the contest, all three judges scored it in favor of Edwin Rodriguez, a clean sweep, 10 rounds to nothing. Will Rosinski and company, boy, they were up in arms. I remember featuring him on my show the following week. But yeah, yeah, I remember that. Looking at the fight, though, you could, even though every round was very competitive, you could make a case for Edwin winning every single round. They were all competitive, yeah. but Edwin, you know, the judges saw it the same way I did. I actually saw it in favor of Edwin 10 nothing. also. So yeah, yeah. conceivably, even though it's a very close competitive fight, See, and the, and the problem that the fans and some trainers and fighters actually look, they don't, keep, they don't remember that a fight is scored on a round-by-round -round basis. And mm -hmm. they'll look at the fight and say, wow, it was a really close fight. I think it deserved to be maybe, you know, six rounds to four or maybe seven rounds to five in a 12-round fight. But they're just judging by how close it is and competitive it is. But if you can make a case for one fighter winning every single round, yeah, it could conceivably be a clean sweep. But rather than explaining it that way, have you ever heard anyone explain these fights that way on TV? Mm. No, they mm. always go to, yeah. well, there's something wrong here. There's got to be corruption. Yeah, and it's bad for the sport, Gogi. Yeah, but yeah, you make a look, very look. valid point, though, because I've heard of promoters actually taking some judges out to a steak dinner the weekend of a big fight. <laughs> oh, they, look, the promoters or the, it's not it's, it's the sanctioning bodies, Joe. They you know they mm. have their judges. Each one, the BA has their judges, the BC, the BF, and you mm. know they're all you know they're all in that little car together, and they make sure that, you know. A house fighter, they want to win. You know, they give them, they favor them. Yeah, they give them the favoritism. That's why you got to knock them out, Joe. You know, you got to knock these guys out when you go in there. You really don't get a fair shake. Well, yeah, I tell you what. Uh, to be honest with you, I didn't even think that Abel Ramos deserved to be competing for a version of the WBA title. Now, I just checked on. There's a there's a, a headline on Boxing Scene that reads. Your Danius Ugas dominates Abel Ramos and captures the WBA regular title, but that's not accurate. This was for the vacant WBA welterweight title. A couple weeks mm -hmm. ago, Jamal James won the WBA regular title. So now, Gogi, we have three champions, huh. WBA champions in one 147-pound weight division. You've got Manny oh. Pacquiao, who's the super WBA now you've got your Danius Ugas, who is the vacant WBA welterweight champion. And then you've got Jamal James, who's the WBA regular title holder. Uh, hmm. Whose fault is that, Joe? <laughs> whose fault is that? It's, it's Gilber Gilberto Mendoza who, who does all this stuff. And the thing is, uh, you know, the, the owl lets him get away with it, okay? So you can't mm. blame just Gilberto. Uh, you got you know you got to blame Al because you know he's in charge of this stuff and the and the TV networks that allow this crap to go on. And Joe, when you do that, you lose the, the credibility. Of the sport is lost. Okay, I remember back in the days, man. When, you know, I got into stuff when I was a kid. When a guy was a world champion, it meant something sacred. It means, oh my God, he's the best in the world. He's a world champion. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, fast forward now, a guy's a world champion. Oh yeah, really? What 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 weight division and what? What, what subtitle? You know, is he a world champ? So it's become a fucking fraud. No credibility this sport has none because of two well, sanctioning bodies. According to Mr. Gilberto Mendoza, no. go ahead, no. sir. Not only Mendoza, there's two sanctioning bodies that do that. Mm -hmm. Mauricio Suleiman does it, and Mendoza. Mm -hmm. The IBF don't do it. Paco Vericell don't do it in the WBA. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? WBO, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, the WBO. So, yeah, the WBO. So according to Gilberto Mendoza, right, if you win that WBA regular title in whatever division you're in, he says that automatically or that should tell networks and fans that you've just been elevated from a mere prospect to an actual contender. That was his <laughs> definition of it. He's but you shouldn't be winning a title then if you're just a mere contender, Gogi. Your final well, thoughts on this before we move forward, brother. My final thoughts, they do it for one reason, to create all those uh, them champions, to get sanctioning fees. Bottom line, to get sanctioning fees, okay? They get 3% every time these guys, you know, uh, fight for the title. Or, or the challenger, they, get, they take 3% from his belt, okay? That's the reason why they do this. It's, that's the only reason why. It's not to give fighters opportunities. That's a bunch of bullshit. Okay, it's to get, you know, it's to rich their pockets, basically, okay? Yep, so tonight on the flagship channel of Fox, not only were we, uh, well, treated to a glorified sparring session in the main event, but also a terrible scored fight, terribly scored fight, and we have another bogus title holder in quite possibly the most or a talent and rich division in all of boxing. Thanks for that, PBC. Thanks for that, Fox. Goodness gracious. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. once again, go. you're right on the money. Promoters shouldn't be encouraging this behavior from the WBA. Wow. Like this would yeah. cease to exist if Al didn't say, hey, this is a title fight and sold that to Fox. Yeah. It's... I was I was letting them get away with it, but you know Mendoza, you know, like I said, it's a big sh- boxing's a fucking sham. It has no credibility. Look at UFC, Joe. Look at the ratings they get. Look at the the pay per view buys they get still in this COVID era. Look at the press they get, Joe, to the build up for these fights from ESPN. That's they're treated like the NFL, the NBA, you know, uh, 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 what do you call it? A mainstream sport. Boxing. Oh God. Because of all all this fuck ups and and, and and it keeps shooting itself in the foot, it, it it it's basically become a niche niche sport. And get this, Joe, they're not capturing the new fans in the sport, the eighteen to forty nine year old you know group that coveted eighteen to forty nine year old age group. They're not getting. They're not you know right now. There's a bunch of old guys like me that are you know that are are fans of the sport, but the younger generation they're not getting attracted to the sport. Uh, you know, they talk about UFC a lot. Everybody, I, you know, everybody I, I talk to a lot, they, you know, they, they talk about UFC. It has credibility in that organization, Joe. Yeah, and especially during this pandemic, because that's one of the problems that Canelo Alvarez and DAZN and Golden Boy Promotions, I should say, are having, right? It's like the, the, every time Golden Boy, and, and Eddie Hearn knows this, right? Because, you know, most people say, well, Canelo Alvarez, and I'm of that mindset, Canelo Alvarez should be willing to work with the zone, right? And this is, unfortunately, every promotional organization has their own agenda, especially when you're talking about limited funding during this pandemic. Because when Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Sport is shot over a contract or a proposal, boy, he turns it down. Rather than actually working with Golden Boy Promotions to make these fight a re- fights a reality on his own, oh no no no, mate, this is this is the era of inflated purses, right? We we want more th- more like instead of five million dollars, we want closer to ten or twelve million dollars. What? Well, it's not there. It's not there. Gogi, your thoughts on this before we start talking about um, Jamel Herring's performance last night? About what? About the person being in the or the own. fighters want too much money? Oh, the promoters. They're not on the same page. They're not working. It's almost like interpromotional matchups are an impossibility yeah. at this point in time. When you've got guys like Keith Thurman and Al Heyman sending over a $10 million proposal, uh, an asking price, a $10 million price tag to fight Terrence Crawford. On ESPN, that's absurd. That's basically Look, Joe, pricing uh, yourself out. Our, our sport is badly fractured right now. Okay, uh, if, if nobody's working with each other to make the best fight. Everybody has their own agenda. Al has his agenda. 
uh, top rank has their agenda. But top rank's willing to work with you. But, you know, guys, Al ain't, okay? Uh, who else? Uh, Eddie Hearns, well, you know, you know he's uh, you know he's not really an American pro, uh, promoter. He's a more like a, a UK promoter. But uh, you know who Golden Boy? You, you know they work with. Do you think that's Golden why Boy his prices with, uh, are so much more inflated? Because uh, maybe it's a better situation in the, the UK. No, Joe, the zone gave him a lot of money. He gave they gave him a big budget. So what do you got to do to attract the best fighters? You you give them big purses. Okay, fighters, you know, you know, they go for the, they go where the money's at. And when Eddie got all that money from uh, the zone, you know what I mean? He started signing all these fighters and giving them, you know, just ridiculous amounts of money. Not only the, uh, the fighters he signed, but the opponents. Oh, I heard the opponents were getting paid real good, man. So, but guess Jeez. what? Some days are over with Joe. The zone, they're on life support, and they're cutting back. Uh, they're, you know, they're cutting back drastically on the shows they're doing and the money they're paying the fighters. Well, some fighters and some promoters just aren't getting the memo, unfortunately. But I'll tell you what, we'll touch on this if we have a little bit more time because we have so much more ground to cover, Gogi. Last night, Jamel Herring retained his WBO 130-pound title. Or I'm sorry, his, uh, yeah, well, yeah, his version of the 130-pound title, right? Yeah, the uh, WBO. It was the WBO. I was right. Okay. Uh, against... Well, by way of disqualification over Jonathan Akendo. Uh, Gogi, did you see this? <laughs> yeah, I saw the fight. I, you know, I watched it today, the replay. Yeah, it was an ugly, just an ugly fight, you know. Uh, number one, Okendo can't fight. And number two, uh, Herring, Herring can't fight in the pocket. You know what I mean? So, after the fight... A lot of the fans had a lot of criticism, including Tim Bradley at ringside. He was saying, you know what? I'm sorry, but if you're a champion, you shouldn't quit like that on your stool. When the going got tough and he got a couple cuts, he elected to quit. And so a lot of fans have been regurgitating, regurgitating that sentiment and been lighting him up on social media. They've been lighting up Jamel Herring on social media. And he said, you know what? I'm not proud of my performance, but you know what? I don't deserve to be receiving this kind of criticism. So, Gogi, what are your thoughts on his basically electing to, do, to basically throw in the towel and cry to the doctor and say, hey, I can't see. You need to stop the fight. Did he do the right thing? So, hmm. number one, every time your opponent tries to get inside and tries to outmuscle you, and, all, and the only thing you could do is just wrestle – Russell him and tie him up. That shows. That tells me one thing: you don't have no skills to fight in the trent in the trenches. Okay. Now me, I would have been dirty as fuck. If that guy's gonna try to headbutt me, you know what I'm gonna do, Joe? <laughs> He's gonna run right into my forearm coming in. Okay, my lead hand forearm. Boom, like like Mayweather was doing against Ricky Hatton. Okay. Mm-hmm. And when he runs into my lead forearm, he's gonna get some uppercuts. Okay. Uh, a left uppercuts and left uppercuts to the body. Then I'm gonna. Then you know what else I'm gonna do, Joe? I'm gonna pull the old Hector Camacho trick. You know, throw that jab out there, leave it out there, and pull your head down and hit you with a left uppercut. You know, pin pivot around. <laughs> you know? No, no. If you guys gonna get dirty and the ref ain't gonna think the thing, ref ain't gonna do nothing about it, well, guess what? I'm gonna get dirty too. I'm gonna tell my fighters start hitting them on the hips. You know what I mean? Start hitting them on his hips. You know, uh, just you know, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the slowest movement down. Okay. Start elbowing him a lot. Start putting that forearm in his face. Start pushing his head down. Mayweather did a perfect job, man, when he fought Ricky Hatton. Every time Hatton tried to come in there and muscle him, put that forearm in his face, he pulled his head down, ripped him uppercut. Oh, yeah, that's what you got to do when a guy tries to get nasty with you. But, uh, yeah, you know, that's what – and Herring, you know, he was just being too – he was just being too nice and too sweet and, you know, like he was selling Girl Scouts. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the the intentional clash of heads, right? Tony Weeks yeah. ruled that it was an intentional clash of heads in the fifth round that opened up that ugly gash over his right mm-hmm. eye. Mm-hmm. But once again, Herring elected to continue with the fight for another three rounds. After round eight, between round eight and nine, 
he told the doctor, you know what, I can't see, this is enough, I'm, I'm tired of this, this is absurd. And it was obvious that he quit. Tim Bradley called him out on it. But when you've got a huge money fight looming overhead against the jackal Carl Frampton, isn't that the intelligent maneuver, Gogi? What do you think about Herring and McIntyre's, well, decision to, well, just throw in the towel? Hey, that's a smart move, Joe. I mean, obviously, you know, he would have kept on getting headbutted because he didn't know how to defend himself against those headbutts. And, you know, you know the cuts would have got worse. Uh, maybe, you know, he maybe got a, uh, would have got a concussion, which maybe would have po- postponed the fight longer. So, you know, I know Tim, I heard Tim Bradley was, uh, you know, you know, you know, saying that, I don't know, he was taking the easy way out and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, eh, you know I, I'm not the fighter, you know. Yeah. He want, they made that decision, you know, uh, it's more like a business decision than more of a, you know, uh, the Mexican fighters, oh, no, I want to fight, I want to fight and get beat up more, you know. They, you know, they, you know to me, Joe, it was a good, smart business move. Let's just, we got the win and move on to another day. Yeah, it's not like it was a Sinelani to fair, Gogi. It was a dreadful yeah. fight, and with Jonathan Akendo, it was obvious he, he, he wasn't trying to throw any punches on the way in. He was using that batter, battering ram of a head of his mm-hmm. just to try and hurt Jamil Herring. So yeah. I agreed with the decision. I didn't criticize him. But this is what Jamel Herring had to say on his, well, Twitter account. He said this, quote, I accept all criticism. I'm not going to run and hide from it, nor will I celebrate or make any excuses about tonight. If anything, I'm more frustrated, and I need to tighten up for Frampton. It's as simple as that. Well, the criticism on his Twitter feed kept on coming in. Everyone was calling him a quitter on it. You can go see this, guys. It's still up. So yeah. he responded a little bit later while he was at the hospital with pictures of his eye and going into a CAT scan. He said, you know what? I'm sitting in a hospital alone. And this is quoting Jamel Herring. Man, I'm sitting in a hospital alone while being called out with all sorts of negativity. Boy, this is something else. I'm not angry. I'm not sad. Just deep in thought. I I will still fulfill my obligation against Frampton, but that fight very well may be my last. I lost too much time for my family as it is. I don't deserve this, end quote. Wow. Your thoughts on Jamel Herring's, well, uh, statement of disgust on his Twitter feed. Ah, Joe. This is a different era of boxing. This is a social media era, so you're gonna, of course, you're gonna get criticized uh, a lot more publicly. And yeah, man, you just gotta take it like a man and have a thick skin and just, you know, move <laughs> on. It ain't no big deal. I mean, so what you get criticized and hey, man, you know, um, don't take it personally. You know, I heard his wife took it personally, and she wants him to get it get out after the Frampton fight. But ah, you know, to me, have a thick skin and just move on and everything. You know, who cares with the you know, you just got to have that, you know, who cares what they say, you know, just, you know, just be a so professional. So this is quite job. shocking, and, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, Gogi, and you're right, we're living in a different era. Since when do fighters, when, since when are they able to take a shot on the chin, punches to the face for 12 rounds, and get their feelings hurt after the fight from a couple of messages on Twitter? Yeah. Did yeah. you ever think that you would see this in boxing? <laughs> ah, man, as soon as social media came out, ah, geez, everybody has their opinion and everything. And all those bitches, you know, they, they hide behind those fake-ass handles where they won't throw their face, fake names, fake handles, and they ain't got no balls, you know, to, you, know, you know what I mean, to show who their real identity is. And they're going you know, to talk all that shit, you know. But I learned uh, – I learned over time, yeah, I just, uh, okay, just, you know what I do, Joe? I just block them when I hear that shit. You know, block them, okay? <laughs> I ain't got time for that crap. Yeah, it's shocking. You get fans arguing with experts like yourself. Buddy McGirt was complaining about that same thing. He was in shock. He's like, okay, well, I just told everyone how it is, and you've got these clowns arguing with me on Twitter. I'm yeah. not only a former champion, but... I'm a world-class trainer. He's a Hall of Famer. He's a Hall of Famer. (laughs) And fans are still trying to argue with this guy. (laughs) Yeah. That's when you step back, Joe. 
me, when I, you know, what I do is block their dumb ass. Cause what do I need the headaches for? You know, just block them and just move on, you know, cause ain't no use arguing with a, a stupid, a stupid idiots, you know, the waste of time. <laughs> so there it is, Gogi. <laughs> so I tell you what, congratulations to both your Danius Ugas as well as Jamal Herring. Uh, <laughs> For yeah. being successful and becoming title holders <laughs> in the respective yeah. weight divisions. But I tell you what, Gogi, let's move on to the marquee segment of the show, and that's going to be your breakdown of a proposed fight for November 14th, and that's Terrence Crawford versus Kell Brook. Now, once again, mm. Bob Arum is at the, having the painstaking task of trying to negotiate this with Eddie Hearn. He first threw out a proposal of $1.5 million for Kell just to be able to compete for the opportunity to win Terrence Crawford's WBO 147-pound title. Mm -hmm. Eddie Hearn just threw it back and said, no, 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 that's not even close. We're not even in the ballpark. So Aram came back with $2 million, and he said, well, that's that's a bit closer, mate, but, you know, we've got to work harder than it. Your thoughts on this, Gogi? You know, once again, this is during a pandemic. If the fight takes place in Omaha or anywhere in America, Kell Brook may be a superstar in the U.K., but he is a nobody in America. Do you think $2 million is reasonable during this time? What, what the hell has Kell Brook been doing since he got his ass whooped by uh, Golovkin and Errol Smith? Nothing. He's insignificant. <laughs> I mean, shit. You know what I mean? What has he been doing? His last fight, he looked like shit, and and I haven't seen him fight since. He hasn't been active. He's not the same fighter, Joe. He ain't. The, he's not the same, same fighter since he got that ass with him from Golovkin. Okay. Well, well, not only that, he hasn't competed at 147 pounds since he got his ass whooped by Earl Spence. Yeah. He's been competing at 154 pounds. Hmm. Yeah. So, so once again, I'm I'm just scratching my head at Eddie Hearn. Is he trying to be an obstructionist? Is he yeah. trying to stand in the way of these great matchups being made? Yo, the old saying in boxing: when fighters or promoters start outpricing themselves, that means they really don't want to fight. Okay. Well, it's hard to disagree with you, but just in case this is being made for November fourteenth. We're going to go through with your analysis and final prediction. Guys, let's rattle off the tell the tape for Terrence Bud Crawford. He's going to be entering the ring. Let's see, he is turning 33 on the 28th of this month. So he's going to be entering the ring at age 33. He fights, well, out of the Orthodox and the Southpaw stance. He stands in the center of the ring at 5 foot 8 inches tall. He fights behind a 74-inch reach from Omaha, Nebraska, Terrence Bud Crawford has a perfect record at 36 wins, zero losses, zero draws, 27 big wins coming by way of knockout. And this would serve, Gogi, as Terrence Crawford's fourth title defense of that WBO title. So what are the strengths and weaknesses, if you can find any, of Terrence Bud Crawford, sir? The strengths... Probably the game's premier, most versatile fighter. Why? He could box right-handed effectively, and he could box left-handed effectively. But what makes him so effective, Joe, he does it with equal skill level from both stances. Mm. And the number one weapon in boxing is the jab, okay? He throws it with equal equal skill and equal high-level boxing IQ from both stances, Joe. He's a a natural chameleon. He knows how to make adjustments in the ring, okay, uh, at the drop of a dime. Uh, what do you call it, Joe? Uh, he, uh, he's just a multidimensional fighter, Joe. Uh, makes it so difficult for his opponents to figure him out because, like I said, Joe, when he's fighting in the right-handed stance, he'll box you. Beautiful. Get that jab established. Control range and distance. Uh, counter you beautifully. But if you feel that his opponent is getting – Momentum started. He'll switch chances to the southpaw position to you know to stop your momentum and box you from the southpaw position, which is totally you know different punches coming from different angles. But the thing is, Joe, he's a very effective at using his jab from the southpaws 
in, in picking you apart, landing the straight left hands, uh, the counter right hooks. And, you know, once he gets once he gets you going and you're slowing down, that's when he likes to take it in inside and start breaking down with body shots and everything. Just, Joe, not only the most versatile in his skill sets, but, you know, probably one of the top three fighters boxing IQ-wise in, in the game. Yeah, he just, like I said, Joe, multi-dimension, multi, multi-dimensional fighter from both stances, high boxing IQ. He knows how to use his skill level stances, and he knows how to make those adjustments on, on a drop of a dime, Joe. He's, yeah, he's tough out, Joe. And uh, Joe Brooks is going to get his ass whooped. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. And, you know, not only all of those attributes that you just named from a technical perspective, he's got the strongest mental resolve, I think, in boxing other than Tyson Fury, possibly. This is a gentleman who always is calm and relaxed and truly believes he is the best fighter in the sport. Yep. Um, Talk about the mental awareness and how strong Terrence Crawford is. Composure and poise. No matter how tough the fight gets in there, no matter you know how bad it's uh, storm, uh, uh, raining in there, he's always calm and cool, you know, thinking, uh, uh, making adjustments. See, see, Joe, that's remember we talked about last week, being relaxed, staying loose. The more relaxed you are, uh, the more calm your mind is. Uh, the more calm your mind is, the better, uh, the better your ability to think and adapt and make adjustments. And that's what Terrence Crawford is. Okay, him and Ward have the ability or the uh, yeah him and Ward have the ability to control range and distance as good as anyone in boxing Floyd Mayweather and this kid uh this new kid coming up the uh, uh Shakur Stevenson okay them are the four mm-hmm. fighters I've seen in the last probably I don't know last 20 years had to have that you know unique ability to control range and distance uh, they do it they have a game plan and they stick to that game plan and they don't get flustered okay and that's that's their main thing, Joe. Control range and distance. Okay, break your break your uh, fighter down uh, mentally. And what you, you know, you know, Joe, the guy has a, you know he he had like I said, Joe. This fight coming. If this fight happens, one guy it's gonna be a uh, it's gonna be one guy playing chess and one guy playing checkers. Okay, uh, the guy <laughs> playing chess is a grandmaster. The guy playing checkers is gonna get his ass whooped. You know who we're talking about. <laughs> well, Gogi, maybe you can shed some light on this because this was a head scratcher. For some strange reason, it's become en vogue among diehard fight fans to criticize Bud Crawford, saying that his resume at 147 pounds sucks, yeah. and they think that that's an indictment that maybe Bud is a protected fighter or is <laughs> not as good as the critics say he is. Yeah, yeah. I can't understand that logic, and to me, it's just a bunch of nonsense, especially when you consider he just won the title by knocking out Jeff Horn, the guy who defeated Manny Pacquiao to win the title, in 2018. Mm. And he's had two mandatory title defenses in Jose Benavides Jr. and Igas Kavalaskas, in which they were both undefeated fighters, and he knocked them out within the distance. And yeah. then, obviously, his voluntary... He stopped Amir Khan. So he's only had three title defenses, all ending in knockout. Every single fight at 47 up to this point has resulted in a resounding and decisive knockout. Yet this guy gets considered prob- or gets criticized probably more than anyone in the sport currently. Um, do you have any idea why? Because, look, you can't blame him. PBC got the top welterweights. I mean, they got a lot of big names, but Al don't want to cross the fence and bring his guys over, okay? It's Al. He's the big obstructionist. I don't know my making a deal, but it's Al, okay? Al has been the biggest obstructionist in boxing since he got into business, okay? He's a control freak, okay? Uh, he's a promoter. Don't He controls the TV. He controls the promoter, and, you know, he determines who fights and who doesn't fight and how much you get paid and everything. He's a... You know he got. You know he does everything. He, he skims uh, the laws of the Muhammad Ali Act, but he gets it done. Okay, and smart man though. You know he's a smart man. If I had to do a business, 
you know, Dana does the same thing, but at least Dana puts the best fights on possible for the fans. Al doesn't do that. So, you know, I know Porter. He's, you know, he's a good man, a good fighter. He's a real pro- He'd fight Crawford and Harvey, you know, Spence and all them guys. But someone's always holding it up, and that's Al Heyman because he has his agenda. Like I said, Joe, this sport's very fractured. You know, there's too many uh, uh, promoters with their own agendas, okay? And very rare that you have uh, these guys want to work with each other. Yeah, it's hard to fault Terrence Crawford when you've got a guy like Keith Thurman and Al sends over a contract requesting a mandatory or a guaranteed $10 million just to step in the ring with TC. He didn't even make $10 million when he fought Manny Pacquiao, Gogi. When has he ever made $10 million? Like I said, Joe, when they start overpricing themselves, that means they really don't want the fight. It's all bullshit. It's all a bluff. (laughs) Well, I tell you what, let's go back to the tail of the tape. Gogi, now you mentioned all of Terrence Crawford's many strengths. Do you see any weaknesses in his arsenal? Eh, you know, I've seen him get hurt, you know, by Gamboa. Got wobbled a little, you know what I mean? Uh, his inside game uh, is not, you know, really great. I mean, he, he, he'll, fight, he'll fight inside, Joe. Uh, like when he breaks you down and he knows you're not going to throw back. And, he, you know, he'll take it in the pocket and break it down. But if somebody's uh, good at, you know, pressuring you or, or uh, if somebody's really skilled in the pocket, I, uh, he'll tie you up. Yeah, he, he won't, you know, get in, in, in it. You know, he's smart. He won't get in an exchange. He'll just smother you and tie you up and take it on the inside. But the guy has very few weaknesses, Joe, if any. I mean, he, he's he got weaknesses. You know, probably I'd say is, you know, the only weakness I've seen is, you know, he got hurt that one time against Gamboa, you know what I mean? But uh, top one of the top three fighters in the world, him, Lomachenko. You know, they got Canelo, they got uh, uh, Inoue, and, you know, they got a few other guys up there that are real good fighters. Well, I think, yeah, his only maybe possible indictment is that maybe his balls are too big at times, where he likes to bang, and, well, it's very sporting of him, but it doesn't make for an easier fight. <laughs> well, I, I don't, no, no, I think he, he, he'll break it down from distance and range, okay, Joe? But once he sees you slowing down, he'll take it in the pocket because he knows you're not going to throw, okay? And uh, then he'll, you know, then he'll break you down more and uh, hurt you more, like he did with Jeff Warren, like he did with uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Al, Al sent that guy over as an opponent. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, John Molina, you know. Oh, like John Molina Jr. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the rare times, Al. You know, Al know Al knows he couldn't do nothing with Molina, so hey, you know, I might as well just. You know, pimp him over there to air him and make a few bucks for him. Yeah, well, I tell you what, if um, his only chink in the armor is the inside game, well, he's not going to have very much of a threat against his potential opponent on November 14th, and that's Mr. Kell Brooks, Special K. Guys, yeah. the special one, Mr. Chocolate Brownies, he's going to enter the ring at age 34. He fights out of the orthodox stance. He stands five foot nine inches tall in the center of the ring. Fights behind a sixty nine inch reach from Sheffield, England. He uh, has a very impressive record at thirty nine wins, two losses, both by knockout to Gennady Golovkin and Errol Spence Jr. Zero draws, twenty seven big wins coming by way of knockout. What's there to like about Special K Kell Brook, Gogi? Mm, let me see. That he's punctual. <laughs> He'll show up on time. He'll show up on time to the win. He'll show up on time to the fight. <laughs> That's it. He's going to get his ass whooped, okay? All right? He's not the same fighter, Joe. Okay? Golovkin took a lot out of him, and Spence took a lot out of him. He has. He, and then after that, he fought one time. He didn't look all that good. Yeah. Well, he's actually, just, Gogi, you know, he's he talks, fought he took, three times, right? He's fought three times against very underwhelming, uh, perfunctory opponents, as Jim Lampley would say, right? And they've all well, been at the one junior them. middleweight level. He fought I only Rob seen Chaka one of them, and he didn't look all that good. So, like I said... I'm sure, I'm sure you're referring to that, uh, well, snoozer against Michael Zarafa in 2018 in December, right? Yeah, I can't remember who it was. It, it, it's, yeah, it was a snoozer, because I quit watching it after a few rounds. 
Well, I tell you what, what does he have to do to be successful? What are his keys to victory against Bud Terrence Crawford? It ain't his keys to victory. Is what Crawford has got to not do, and that is not take care of business in training, uh, not staying focused, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, that's it. It's not him. He ain't going to do shit. Crawford comes in 100%. You know, only way he's going to win is land, you know, land a lucky punch and knock out Crawford and everything, you know what I mean? Uh, and, you know, and pray that he hopes that Bomack, you know, gives, uh, you know, uh, Crawford tequila shots uh, between the rounds, you know, get him drunk and everything, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> he ain't going to do shit but get his ass whooped. Crawford comes in there like he usually does. Look, this game, like I said, Brook ain't got no inside game. He's going to fight everything from range, okay? He don't know how to fight in the pocket. All he does is grab and hold like a bitch. So if he tries to play chess, with, if he tries to play chess with Crawford from the outside, oh Jesus, you're playing the you're playing the Crawford strength. Crawford's gonna pick him apart, right-handed or left-handed. You know what I mean? Countering, boxing, whatever. You know what I mean? It's gonna be real easy work for Crawford. Brooks, wow, got a you know, and to prayer. be and to be honest with you, I'm not even sure that Kell Brook can still make 147 pounds, Gogi. He yeah, hasn't yeah. made the welterweight limit since 2017. That's no, three geez. years ago, Gogi. At age 34, can this guy still compete at 147? His day, best days are, are are gone, Joe. He's just going there to get a. He's just going in there to get a payday. That's why they're asking. Uh, uh, Aaron for all that money. They know they ain't got a chance in prayer to win. They're just going to try to cash him out. In your opinion, besides Errol Spence, who actually poses the biggest threat against Bud Crawford? Oh, the guy on uh, the other side of the fence, that that uh, Spence. Yeah, he's them are the two top guys. That fight should have been made already. But it ain't Aaron. It's, that, it's Al. He's the biggest obstructionist in boxing, okay? That fight should have been made already. Then again, you know, Earl got in that bad accident and everything. So, But that fight, you know, like, like I said, all, all they do is talk, talk, talk nowadays. These fuckers, these motherfuckers. Talk, 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 talk. Talk, 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 talk. They never get, you know, they never get fights done. They're full of shit. That's why I lost a lot of respect for this game, man. Because fighters ain't fighters like in the past. You know, uh, you know, they made fights, no problem. You know, now, you know... Oh, let's marinate it for four years. Let's, uh, you know, let's talk about it and get everybody excited. Oh, they're full of shit. That's why, you know, me, Joe, uh, I don't, there's only a few fight, fighters out there, you know, I really, uh, I got, a, you know, I got a lot, I got some, I got admiration for, but a lot of them, they're just full of shit. Well, I tell you what, Spence made his, so, well, first, before we actually move forward, talking about the return of Errol Spence Jr., on uh, slated for November 21st, the following weekend. Your official prediction for Terrence Crawford versus Kell Brook. Joe, ask me how bad Kell Brook is going to get his ass whooped. Ask me. <laughs> how bad ask is me, he going to get his ass whooped? Tell me, brother, how bad is he going to get his ass whooped? Real bad. Real bad. <laughs> That's my prediction. Okay. <laughs> And there you have it, guys. That's Gogi's, well, brief analysis I mean, Joe, of what, the I mean, what, fight well, between TC and Special K. To, well, I can't think of nothing what he could do to, to beat Crawford. Okay? <laughs> I said talk a good game. He talks a good game, but talk don't win it when you get in that ring. Okay? What can he do? You know? I mean, come on, Joe. Uh, yeah. Nothing. Well, I tell you what, looking at the fight, the other side, uh, the fighter that everyone wants to see TC face, Errol Spence Jr. was, well, aired from his home uh, during the Fox coverage this evening. Is it just me, Gogi, or does Errol Spence always look like he's waking up from a nap or stoned? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He does, right? So, so anyway, so he had to say this, right? Quote, man, I got so many gears. I can box, bang, sit there. I can use angles. Danny only has one gear. Counterpunch and be patient. 
With me, yeah. he's got to train for everything. I'm going to dictate everything that's going to happen in that fight. End quote. Do you agree with that, Gogi? Yeah, Spence is a good all-around fighter. I mean, he he's a good boxer. He uses like he just don't come forward. Okay, he he'll box you too, Joe. He'll use his footwork, move in and out of range. Okay, uh, you know to uh, make sure he don't get hit. Then uh, he works behind a good jab, uh, but he likes. Uh, he could counter punch it. He can hit you from, uh, you know, with combinations, medium range. But his best, his best attribute is in the pocket. You know, applying uh, intelligent, hard physical pressure, uh, putting his combinations together, up and down, down and up, from all different angles. Okay, his combinations come from that. Yeah, uh, he's a beautiful. Uh, what do you call it? He's one of the game's best inside fighters. One of the game's most intelligent pressure fighters. Okay, Joe. He. You know, that was before he got in an accident, okay? But, yeah, man, and and he's got a heart. He showed me that in the, in the Porter fight, which was a hell of a fight, you know, where he had to really dig down. Uh, it was a tough fight. Porter came ready to fight. He came in shape, and he got hit more than he ever got hit in the fight. And there were some tough moments in, in the fight where he had to bite down and keep, a, keep his composure and poise and weather the storm, which he did. And he came back, I think, in the 11th round and dropped him and everything. Oh, that was a hell of a fight. That was one of the fights of the year and everything, okay? So you got to give him credit. Yeah, I give, I give Spence credit. Yeah, he's a, he's a solid fighter, uh, all-around fighter, not just one-dimensional. Garcia is more, you know, a laid-back counter-puncher. He reacts to what you do, then he'll throw, you know, his punch out. But he's not a good uh, lead-forward combination puncher, okay? He's the kind of guy that likes to kick back and wait, uh, time you uh, when you're throwing punches, and he likes to counter with punches, you know, with, you know especially, you know, that, uh, you know, that uh, beautiful – counter left hook he likes to throw you know what i mean but uh he's he's not a he's not a very what do you call it a high punch volume uh puncher he just you know lay back natural counter puncher that just likes to counter off your mistakes yeah yeah and this is what danny garcia because he was listening in and they were both on the air at the same time and this is what this was his response to errol spence's previous quote that i just stated he said this, quote, I'm going to have to disagree with that. I can outbox the sluggers and outbang the bangers. I faced the hardest hitters and my chin stood up to the test. I fought the fastest fighters and I beat them because I was better, not just because I was a counterpuncher, end quote. Um, but, Gogi, oh. if anyone should be questioning anyone's resume at 47, um, has Danny Garcia, has he beaten the best fighters at 47? It he seems to me, man, that time. he is the – that he's, well, come up short in he's his big fight at 147 pounds. He's a bridesmaid, Joe. You know what a bridesmaid is? They always oh. come up second. They always come up short. <laughs> always a bridesmaid, never a bride. <laughs> yep. So I tell you what, um, we're going to have to sit down with you one day when we have more time. And probably, well, probably the more intriguing analysis would be Terrence Crawford versus Errol Spence Jr. That would yeah, probably that, be the more yeah. the one that would require more more thought, more effort. Because yeah, this yeah. is uh, oh boy. <laughs> Go, yeah. I tell you what, we we're we're just about out of time, but. Uh, do you have time to maybe address one more issue, sir? Yeah, go ahead. What is it? Okay. Well, Mike Tyson, Iron Mike Tyson, and, and this was very mm. interesting. He was just on the Joe Rogan show this past week, mm. and he actually let it slip. And this isn't a very good idea when you're trying to promote a pay-per-view event on November 28th. He let it slip saying, you know, when I first released that training video, Oh boy, I like I went all out just for the video, and boy, I was in bed for the rest of the week. Yeah, man, mm. I was laid up. I that took everything out of me. End quote. Gogi, is that wise to be revealing that while you're getting stoned with Joe Rogan on the radio? <laughs> mm, he's Mike Tyson, Joe. Everybody tunes in, okay? Whether you know. But it all comes down to this, man. You know, yeah, you know, guys like Tyson Jones, Delahoy, and all these guys that think they could come back and fight. You know, they're old and shot past their prime, and it's a fucking joke. 
You know, this is a young man's sport. You only have one time in your life to do it, and that's when you're in the prime of your life when you're young, okay? Once your uh, prime year, prime youth goes away, you can't do it no more. So, you know, they're just, uh, like I said, living uh, off their name and everything. And uh, to me, it's uh, it's comedy hour. It's comedy hour at the Apollo. <laughs> So you're not surprised that he actually admitted that on the air? Nah, Joe, I know it is. Look, Joe, I remember when I was young, I used to give hand pads all the time to the guys. And, oh, man, I could do it every day, man, because I was young, you know. My body would recover the next day. Now, shit, you know. I don't even give a lot of hand pads nowadays, Joe. The only, to the, the only guys I give hand pads to is the guys that earn it, earn that right. Because, you know, it takes a lot of – I wear and tear. I'm 58 now, and then, you know all that pounding they you know they they put on me and everything. I don't need that shit, okay? The, I still could be an effective coach teacher by you know without using that shit by you know getting in the ring when they're shadow boxing and teaching them stuff when they're on the heavy bag teaching them stuff when they're in the double land when they're sparring doing drills or whatever, okay? Uh, I don't need to fucking work them hand pads and let them you know, tear my body up, okay? You know, uh, but like I said, Joe, you know, I know my body, you know, I know uh, when you when you get older, your your recovery time is not as fast. Yeah. Mm. Oh. You know, makes you appreciate a guy like Emmanuel Stewart, doesn't it? I mean, when yeah. you think about it, he was one of the first guys to start using hand pads. But this is a gentleman at age 66, 67 was still working hand pads with Vladimir Klitschko. Could you imagine yeah, working yeah. mitts with that guy? Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Getting hit <laughs> by that big dude. That big boss. Yeah. Boy, it'd shake yeah. every bone in your body, wouldn't it? <laughs> Man, I don't know how to work pads, though, properly. You know, uh, using the, you know, uh, you know, not this bullshit Mayweather mitt work. He taught the fundamentals, the basics, okay? Balance, footwork, working off the jab, the basic combinations you're going to use in fights, strategies, you know, uh, IQ, you know what I mean? Everything you did, he did on the pads is basically they were, you know, it was basically they're going to do in the fights. Manual, you know, that's what the pads are for, Joe, to teach you the fundamentals, teach you how to polish up on your punches, to, uh, to throw your punches correctly, to uh, teach you how to throw the different ver- uh, variation of punches out there, teach you how to throw body punches, okay? Teach you how to use your jab and work the different variation of, j- variation of jabs, teach you how you throw the different combinations of the body and head. I like to use the pads nowadays, Joe, not more on the outside because of all that. Oh man, when you when you're taking punches from long distance, oh it really puts a shock on your body. I like working on the inside because your body. I like teaching my guys the inside game because it doesn't take. It does my body at 58 years old doesn't take a big shot getting hit at short range, mm-hmm. but that's what I like using the hand pads for, teaching inside fighting. You know the fundamentals. You know the proper stance, elbows tucked in, hands up. You know, uh, uh, good a good a good fundamental stance. You know, your uh, left shoulder pointed, body at a forty five degree angle, not squared up. Set you're setting your feet good, your back leg set good, so you don't get pushed back. Then, then teaching them, you know, the right distance. You know, on 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 how to you know on uh, uh, teaching them the right distance on uh, on on uh, when to throw those punches. So a lot of guys they get all inside. They say, look at Jamel Herring. He had no mm-hmm. like, clue on how to fight in the inside. Okay. He didn't know how Indeed. to, you know, he didn't have the right fundamental stance. He didn't know how to keep his distance. Uh, you know what I mean? Then once you, you know, uh, you know what I mean? He was terrible. All he did was grab and hold. You know, so you don't have no fundamental skill sets. But if you do, you know all this stuff. You know, you know, you know the basic stance. You know that you know your distance. Once you, you got your stance right, you got your distance, and you're in a good defensive, uh, you know, uh, position not to get hit back. That's when you start working them short, sharp, crisp combinations. The uppercut hooks, the uppercut hooks to the head, hook to the body. Uh, the uppercut hook right hand, the uppercut followed by uh, the right uppercut followed by the right, straight right hand, left hook. You know, uh, the body shots, the left uppercut to the body, the right uppercut to the body, the left hooks to the body, the right hooks to the body. Just different variation of combinations in the pocket and everything. That's what I like working now when I work the hand pads is the inside game, Joe, because of working on the outside, you know, them guys are throwing them punches from long distance. Oh, God, they hurt my body. <laughs> well, God bless you, Gogi. You know, I almost forgot. I was going to ask you this live on the air. We'll make this our, well, the very last thing you discuss or, or answer for. I made a post yesterday on Facebook, right? 
advertising oh. our, rec- our recent show with Lee Cleveland. And I stated on the latest episode of Box.Buzz Radio, Fight Saga editor Lee Cleveland shared his opinion on Floyd Mayweather Jr.'s latest efforts, preparing John and Gervonta Davis for his October 24th meeting with Leo Santa Cruz. Do you think Floyd can stay humble enough to become the best trainer in boxing? And your response was this. <laughs> your response was, LOL, Joe, that's like me saying, can Adrian Broner become the next Warren Buffett in the financial world? End quote. <laughs> Look, Joe, being a trainer and being a fighter is total. Being a trainer and being a fighter is night and day, okay? Being a trainer is being a teacher. And you got to be able to learn, know how to train all different styles. Right now, Floyd, he handpicks the guys he wants to train, okay? The guys that can fight, the guys that know how to fight. But, you know, like I said, if you're going to be an effective coach, you got to take guys from scratch or the guys that are wrong green like I got right now who don't know much and develop them, uh, develop the layers and inches in their game, okay? Uh, you know, teaching them how to box teach them how to use their footwork, teach them how to work out their jab, teach them how to use their feint, teach them the different variation of combinations, teach them how to, uh, you know, fight inside uh, and, and, and with, a very, with a different variation of, uh, of attacks. You know, everything, Joe, how to move their head and all this stuff, man. You know what I mean? It's different, man. You know, it, it, a lot of guys, Floyd is going to be like a, like a Freddie Roach type coach. You know, the guys are going to be talented and they know how to fight. So, that's easy. That's easy for guys like that to train. How can you call yourself a great trainer when you got guys like that? You know, that that doesn't. You know, to me, great trainers are like you know, like Nacho Berestein. Take guys from scratch and build them up from zeros to heroes. Okay, uh, you know, guys that you know he could take from the bottom and develop the, you know their foundation and build up. Okay, so guys like, like Manuel. To me, the greatest trainer of all time, Manuel Stewart. Okay, not guy getting guys that can fight already and not that. That ain't that ain't no that ain't a fucking trainer, man. Anybody, I had guys like that, Joe. They're easy to train. They're easy. But when you're taking guys that are raw and green, like I have in the past, like I'm doing now, and develop them and make them a fighter, that's when you consider yourself a competent trainer. So, and another thing is Floyd, you know, is that, you know, the, I, I don't know, you know, he likes to go on vacation a lot. As a trainer, you can't, you know, you're you're, you're the gym is your second home. That the, the countless amount of hours you got to sacrifice. Uh, in that gym, you know, uh, being with your fighters all the time, teaching them and, uh, and you know, watching their development and everything. That's another thing, Joe, why a lot of great trainers, great fighters can't be trainers. They don't understand the developmental process of, 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 of teaching uh, the fighters the fundamentals of the, of, of the game, okay, building them from ground up, okay? They don't know the little uh, intricacies, uh, the nuances of the game, you know what I mean? Uh, it's totally different. Now, Floyd's got a good boxing mind, okay? He's got a good boxing IQ and this and that, okay? He, there's certain fighters, like, you know, guys that are ready to fight. He, he'll be good at But taking less talented guys, uh, he's going to have to prove, show, him, show me he could do that. Take a guy that don't know how to fight inside and teach him the fundamentals. Teach, him, uh, teach a guy that, you know, who has terrible footwork. Uh, and, and, you know, get, getting his footwork in balance right. Teach him how to work off his jab, his feint the different variation of jabs, you know, he's going to have to show me all that, you know I mean? Just because he got a good name and uh, doesn't mean, you know, oh man, he's going to be a great trainer. Cause he's, you know, he's just great fighters, man. When you got great fighters, it makes you so much so fucking easy, man. Guys like Freddie, you know, they got fighters that, yeah, that can fight already. Like Robert Garcia, you know, you've got Virgil Ortiz out of the amateurs. He was, you know, he was a good fighter. Uh, uh, Jose Ramirez, you know, guys can fight and everything, but Robert's also a good fighter. He's also a good coach at developing, uh, the younger guys that are not as, you know, well-known in developing them uh, uh, with good fundamentals, okay? Footwork, balance, working off the jab and all that thing, head movement. Robert's good at that, so I got to give Robert credit. Robert Garcia, excellent coach, uh, very uh-huh. dedicated to his fighters and everything, you know what I mean? And, yeah, Floyd, is he willing, you know, like I said, he, from you know, from what I've seen in the gym, you know what I mean? You know, you can see he, he, he's, you know, he's good at teaching He's good at explaining, but does he know? Does he really know all the nuances of the game? Like, can he can he take younger fighters that don't know nothing and build them up to something? To me, that's a that's well, a little trainer also, manual. Well, also, Gogi, does he have the patience yeah. to do it? That's the number one thing, Joe. Patience, patience. Because you get frustrated when guys can't fight. Like the guys right now, sometimes I'm like, oh Jesus, 
but you got to take a step back and remember these kids don't know how to fight and it takes time to learn skills. You don't learn skills overnight. It takes time. Okay. It takes time and patience and, you know, daily training and, you know, they start getting it over the years. They start, you know, they start, you know, you'll see them all of a sudden. Okay. They, he's starting to get it. You know, at first when you are teaching them stuff, oh, geez, but all of a sudden, one day, you know, okay, now we're starting to get it. But, you know, it's a, 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 it's a lot of the little things you got to build in a fighter, man. But it starts with fundamentals, the footwork, the balance, and teach them how to work out that jab, the feints, the head movement, you know what I mean, uh, different, uh, and the combinations from range, you know, how, you know combinations of send, you know, setting them up with feints and everything. Just, just so many things they got to, you know, you got you to know how to teach a fighter, Joe, especially if a guy don't know what's green, that don't know much, that doesn't have a big amateur background, doesn't have a big pro background, well, you got your work cut out for it. Yeah. And Floyd, like I said, it's easy to train guys, you know, like Freddie gets or, uh, or uh, you know, Floyd's getting out right now. Or, you know, or, you know, you see a lot of them training. Like Joel Diaz, I think he's an excellent trainer, but he gets a lot of good guys that uh, Badin, uh, you know, throws them, uh, the, the Russian guy or that, yeah, that throws them all them top U- Ukrainian guys. You know, them guys have big amateur backgrounds, three or 400 amateur fights. You know, he, uh, Joe's job is to transition them to the pro, but that's easy when you got a guy with three, four hundred amateur fights to transition them. Because you know why, Joe? One thing I found out is when you got guys, look, look when you got guys that are not experienced, don't have a, a good amateur background, don't have a lot of pro fights, the learning curve is a lot longer when you're teaching them stuff. They don't pick up, they don't pick up as fast, and sometimes you know it takes a, it takes you two years to develop that foundation. But when you get guys like uh, Joel Diaz is getting, their learning curve is a lot faster. They're, you know, instead of two, three years, you know, it's probably eight to 12 months where they pick up stuff and learn stuff faster. See, all that amateur background, all them amateur fights, okay, from uh, at the highest level, fighting the top level guys, different styles, okay, that's something you can't teach them. But when you get them and you teach them stuff, you can see they'll pick it up faster than uh, guys that don't have that big amateur experience or background. I'll give you an example. I had a guy, Pablo Ramirez. Uh, it was back in 15. He was a two-time national gold glove in 2015, 2016. He won it for me. Before I got him, he had 80 amateur fights. He was just, you know, nothing, nothing, not a, not a, not a, what do you call it? A top-notch amateur at the senior level. He was ordinary because he was missing a lot of skill sets. Okay. Uh, but once I started training and work with him and everything, I started developing it. There, all the skills he was missing, like knowing, you know, knowing how to use his foot, footwork to control range and distance, knowing how to use his feint, how to use his jab to set up his combination, and you know the inside game. You know, teaching him how to fight in the inside. Pernell Whitaker, you know, moving his head in uh, in the inside, shifting his head from you know from shoulder from his opponent's shoulder, from his opponent's you know left shoulder to the right shoulder, right shoulder to left. You know how Pernell Whitaker does it. He'll get inside and he'll shift his head left and right. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, to, to, you know, look for that opening. That's what, and I taught Pablo that, you know, how to shift his head inside from left to right, right to left. And, you know, just all the little things of the game he was missing. But the thing is, because he had a good amateur, you know, 80 amateur fights, he picked up real fast. You know, he picked up real fast and everything. Diego Corrales was another one I had when he was younger. When I started helping him, you know, he had a, uh, you know, he had a lot of amateur fights. So, shit, Diego picked up real fast, you know. Uh, you know, guys like I said, like I said, Joe. Uh, you know, got experience. Like Carson Jones, I turned his career around. I don't know, Carson Jones. Uh, you know, better I remember. than I had back then. He was yeah. He had that seven. very competitive fight with Joe Brooks. Six, he he was sixteen and seven when I got him. He was an opponent with an opponent's attitude. Okay. Boy, but he, he knocked know, out he had Tyrone Brunson. <laughs> yeah. Well, guess what, Joe? Let me give you the story about him. He came into my gym. You know, a guy that didn't have a lot of confidence in himself because he was an opponent. Nobody ever trained him right. First thing I had to do was work, in, work on his mentality, you know, develop some swagger and confidence in him. But uh, the first thing I had to do was teach him how to train like a pro. Okay, once I started teaching him the mental side of the game, all the other, you know, the physical came. But he had a big, you know, he had a, like 60 amateur fights and he had a, over 20 pro fights. So he picked up real quick. So we went on a run, got nine straight wins, and we knocked out. He knocked out Charles, uh, that Brunson guy. Then, you know, after that, he got a, he got good paydays and everything. You know what I mean? Then uh, after that, you know, he uh, had a little problem with my uh, partner, and he left him, and uh, he went to Abel, and Abel, got, Abel made the money off my hard work. Abel Sanchez, yeah. And, uh, oh, he, I remember that. Yep. 
Carson didn't even know how to throw a fucking body shot when I got him. It was loud when I told him, hey, you know, when I was, I was telling him, you know, I threw the left hook, he looked at me, then I said, shit, this guy don't know how to throw body shots. I started laughing, so I had to teach him how to throw body shots <laughs> in the inside. Instead of grabbing and holding like he used to do, I had to, had to teach him how to set in the inside and rip body shots. And he did. He, and he picked up, but he picked up fast, Joe, because he had experience. And that's what happens when you got, you know, that's one thing Floyd's going to find out. It's easy when you got guys with, that can fight and got experience, and you, you know, and, and you can polish up the game. But when you got a guy that doesn't, totally different ball game. And thank God I've, I, thank God I experienced that, Joe. I, I work with guys at different levels. I give you some stories when I was in Colombia. All the talented uh, Venezuelan, Colombian fighters I had over there, they picked up real quick because they had a lot of them had thirty, forty pro fights. A lot of them had three, four hundred amateur fights. So, <laughs> you know what I mean, Joe? The learning curve was wow. a lot faster. Yeah, we'll talk about that one day, I'll tell you. <laughs> but you understand now, Joe, the, brother. You understand you understand now the uh, the the uh, you gotta understand the levels to this game and how you develop different uh levels of fighters. That's what I'm trying to say. And Floyd ain't got the experience to do that yet. Well, he, you know what I mean? Guys, he's expert trainer James Gogi. James, thank you so much for being on the show, brother. We went way over time, but man, it was worth it. Outstanding, Gogi. What a what an amazing, wow! What an amazing breakdown of what it's what's required uh, to become a world class trainer. That's incredible stuff, Gogi. Do you have any parting shots for our listening audience, sir? No, Emmanuel Stewart would say the same thing. Emmanuel was a great. Uh, to me, he's the greatest of all time trainer. Okay, uh, he because he took guys from scratch and the amateurs developed them all the way to the top world champion. Okay. Uh, Manuel will do the same exact thing. He, you know, he he understands the process and everything. But yeah, it's a uh, like I said, Joe. It's a uh, got to be, you know, you got to have a lot of time in the sport, and you got to the hours and uh, the sacrifice you got to make in the gym. And you know, Floyd, he likes to go to Tahiti or he likes to travel around the world on <laughs> on a on Air Mayweather. You know, trainers don't do that. You know what I mean? Trainers are always in that fucking gym. You know, grinding every day. Uh, with their fighters, you know, and uh, and because and, every fighter is different, Joe. You got to evaluate every fighter. You got to find what they're weak at, and you got to you know you got to you develop their weaknesses into strengths. Okay, okay, and that's that's what I'm trying to explain to the fans. Okay, it's a totally different, totally different than fighting. But good luck to him. Good luck to Floyd. Good luck to him. <laughs> you know, good luck to him. Okay. James, thank you so much for being on the program, dude. That deserves. Another round of applause, my friend. What an amazing master class we just, we just experienced. Guys, that's just about going to do it. Uh, it's going to conclude our Sunday efforts with Maestro Gogi. But, guys, we'll be back next weekend. We'll be back on the air with Tuesday with Mr. Rodney Green, back on the air with Box.Buzz Radio with Lee Cleveland on Thursday. That's going to just about do it, guys. We're going to talk about all the upcoming matchups, all the latest boxing news. But thank you so much for listening to this episode of War Week Radio starring James Gogi. Have a great evening, everybody. 